All right, welcome to Mike's session. If you don't mean to be at um, Moral Foundations of Your Political Beliefs, a class activity for teaching habits of mind, then just head back to SCED and find your uh, proper room. But otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, um, but Manisha and I from the collab are here if you need anything, Mike. Please don't leave me. Uh, and you we here won't for leave you, we'll be here. <laughs> Thank you, Robin, and uh, thank you, everyone who is attending. As this session intrudes upon lunch, I really appreciate you coming here. And uh, it feels like it's been a really long day already. You know that recurring nightmare you have where you show up to online school and you look down and you're wearing clothes? No, Mike. We don't know that nightmare. You don't know that one. Well, if I've if I've lost my audience on that opening uh, icebreaker, then this whole thing is going to go south real fast. But I'll uh, try to to pick things up. Let's. I'll get into my presentation, and I'm going to share this window, which I think is the right one. You see a slide? Moral foundations of your political beliefs. Perfect. Super. All right. So. Uh, I'll get into the description of, of what this activity is, but for anyone I think teaching gen ed and, and particularly my silo is uh, tackling a wicked problem. I think it's particularly salient there. But before I get into the details, I'm gonna ask you to tell me what this is. What are we looking at? Go ahead and unmute yourselves. All right, I'll look at a chat. Spiderweb, that's a good guess. And I was thinking what the guesses might be and I didn't think of that one, although it seems perfectly natural. Is it a fingerprint? Uh, it's not a fingerprint either. That's another <laughs> interesting one that I didn't think of. <laughs> what does that look like? Any others? A dartboard. It looks like maybe a dartboard passed through some kind of um, gravitational field or something like that, like uh, Einstein. I don't know. I know Mackie's got something. He's He's got a guess. Or Kristen, she's already heckled me once. Teddy bear belly, uh, that sounds plausible. These are some excellent ideas and it just shows the power of the group here because I didn't think of any of these. Well, I'll tell you what we are looking at. That is a diagram of a tongue, human tongue. And I thought it might've been one of those uh, old ships where they would show the, the cargo places and, and where the uh, stuff was stored. But no, that is a, uh, Robin says these are not excellent ideas. Uh, this is a human tongue and it, it comes from a 1901 dissertation by none other than Joe Biden. Uh, but of course, it's not uh, from Joe Biden. It's from a man who's, I don't, don't know a single other fact about him, David Hainig from the University of Leipzig. And in 1901, uh, after a meticulous study of the human tongue and the taste receptors thereon, uh, published this dissertation. And uh, its salience will, will become clear, but it's, it's scientific, it's detailed, it's full of nuance and, and uh, complexity. Uh, it's hard to decipher, even if I could read German. Uh, and so this will be illustrative as we go on. Oh, and I have to be on the slide in order to advance it. Okay, this you will recognize more familiarly. This is a human tongue. And this is a diagram which is instantly decipherable. It's intuitive. It's um, even, you might say, visually appealing. Um, it also has the quality of being quite wrong. It is a descendant of that earlier diagram and the dissertation that accompanied it. It's uh, a, how many of you have seen a diagram like that of a tongue with different taste areas that supposedly where uh, sour, sweet, salty, and other things are, are detected? So I, I don't see know why some... I clapped for that, but <laughs> I meant to raise my hand somehow. 
Oh, that's fine. I appreciate it. I'll take the applause since I didn't get any um, on my uh, icebreaker. So, um, so this is a diagram that is the, the product of um, simplification, misinterpretation, probably some bad translation, uh, and credulous repetition from the, the aforementioned dissertation. But it's appealing to us because it tells a simple story with a tidy lesson, and that, there's something attractive to human psychology about that. Uh, there are a couple threads in this that I'm going to tie back later in the activity. But first, what I'm going to ask you to do is take the political compass questionnaire. And what I'm going to do right now is drop a link into the chat. And we are going to spend some very awkward silence staring at each other. And uh, it, I think, I hope it will take less than 10 minutes. But I'm going to put this link in here. And you're welcome to click on that link in the chat. Uh, it, it opens up the test or questionnaire that looks just like this. It has six pages of questions about your political, economic, social orientation. And just pick the answer that seems most uh, attractive to you. Don't overthink it or spend too much time on it. Don't get hung up. And then while you're doing that, I'm going to paste a second link in the chat. And I'm pasting that link now. This will be a much longer and more annoying looking link. Uh, I probably should have put some text in there to space those out. But you can see the political compass link is first. And the second link is to a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet already has some values in it. Uh, thanks, Kristen. That's, you earned your, your heckling privileges. Uh, and the results that you get when you're finished that questionnaire are going to look something like this. There's going to be two numbers, economic left, right, and the social libertarian slash authoritarian. And so what I will ask you to do once you finish taking that questionnaire, take those two numbers, find an empty row in this spreadsheet, which is the second link in chat, and just enter those numbers in, and then we will move on once everyone's done that. All right, so if any questions, uh, feel free to speak up or chat me. Otherwise, pretty fun, I would... pretty fun questionnaire given my political head at this moment, Mike. So thanks for that. It's uh, nothing but topical.
So I see some responses, some results starting to come in. Okay, Mike, after I finish the long test, can you just go ahead and remind us again where we get the stuff yeah. we put in the spreadsheet? Yeah, so once you've finished, the results page should have something that looks like this. Can you see that part of my shared presentation? There's a, a four part grid and yep. it shows left, right. Yeah. Okay. But I don't. I don't see any numbers on it. They're not above the, the diagram. I think you have to scroll further down in the results that you get. Scroll down. Oh, I see. Yep. Scroll down is the key. Um, maybe they're not shown above the graph like I have it here. Apologize. They right, are. It's, it's, but it's further down, but above the graph. It's just that there's a graph at the top, so it kind of throws you off. But. Ah, OK. My apologies for that confusion. No, it's all good. This is the hardest thing I will do all day. <laughs> And then, Mike, we put it anywhere. Any empty row is fine. gotten a couple of notifications requesting access and the, I swear I've got the spreadsheet wide open for anyone to edit. Is anyone having trouble getting into it? No. Mike, I'm having trouble getting into it. This is Kathy Tardiff. Okay. Uh, are you confronted with a, uh, a request for access screen? Yep. Hmm. So I, I said, you know, request access. Okay. I don't know what the hang up is, but let me, uh, let me try to grant you access. And if not, I suppose you could put your values in the chat and I could put, put them in. Mm -hmm. You could also privately chat them to Mike so that yeah, you don't that's have to what project I was them. Robin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I just clicked on the link granting access. Okay. And I expected it to give me a prompt confirming that, but perhaps just by clicking the link granted it. So I'm are you in. able to get in? Yep, I'm in. Oh, super. Thank you. The worst thing is unexpected presentation hangups. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any unexpected presentation <laughs> expect them all by the way as a super fast reader i still found that like a lot to do so if you're way behind 
Um, I can only imagine for people who have like reading disabilities or whatever, just take your time there. This is it, you know, or, or stop if you feel overwhelmed. Um, and yeah. you see Laura there is working on access to Mike. Um, so ah, she's having okay. trouble. All right, let me check on that. I think I just granted it a moment ago, but I'll click the link again and make sure. Are you able to get in, Laura? Hold on, let me try again. See, as, as a yes, tech, now I'm in. As a quote unquote tech guy, I hate blaming my problems on the technology, but you can see I have it. Anyone with the link can edit, which makes it perplexing that I'm getting these requests. So uh, if you, uh, yes, Suzanne, if you go through a request, I, I'm not sure, there it is, I just got it. And so I'll click on the link and you should be able to get right in. All right, and I'll continue uh, granting requests as they come in. So thank you for that, everyone. And uh, this is great. So we're getting a number of results, which is wonderful. Um, Jane, you're in. Okay. I will keep my eye open for requests like that so I can grant everyone access who wants to submit results. Of course, it's not required in a real life class setting. If you were to repeat this in one of your classes, you would likely have some people not participating, which I'm sure you would expect. Uh, okay, so thank you for taking that. Uh, that's the first of two components to this. And and we'll draw some lessons from it when we're done. But now I will go on and give a, a very misplaced introduction to this activity. And that is that uh, I, in reading and, and constantly being on the lookout for information and ideas to make my Tackling a Wicked Problem section more productive and interesting, uh, I, over the summer, read a book by Jonathan Haidt called The Righteous Mind. And it is similar in some ways to other uh, popular psychology books I've read by other scholars. Uh, having no expertise in psychology myself, I like to gain these ideas from experts that I respect and uh, incorporate them into classes, uh, both library instruction and tackling a wicked problem. And uh, so we have the book, The Righteous Mind, in Lamson Library. This is not, a, not a, even a new book. It's from 2012, uh, but it's quite salient today. And uh, you can see that subtitle, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and, and Religion. Uh, you don't say. And uh, so I'm granting uh, more access to that spreadsheet. And I'll let that proceed. Okay. Um, if you wanted like digital access to this ebook or other copies, if ours is out, please let me know and we'll, we'll get some for you if you wanted to read this, but it's certainly not necessary. And when I say I was reading The Righteous Mind over the summer, what I mean is that I was listening to the audiobook of The Righteous Mind while I was trying and failing to build my first garden outside. And um, what I ended up with, one of those two activities actually uh, bore some fruit. Uh, what I ended up with were carrots that were entirely too small asparagus that were entirely too big, uh, some very delicious strawberries, which pretty much grow like weeds anyway. Um, and here's a cute one with a nice little slug on top of it. And uh, more cherry tomato tomatoes than any human being could possibly consume in a lifetime. And so what I came up with as I was uh, in those halcyon days in the warm, uh, sunny weather of the summer mid pandemic, um, what took shape in my mind was what I hope to accomplish was uh, something about integrated perspective in the hands-on project-based kind of spirit where uh, we're not just creating things and lecturing in the classroom that just get thrown away at the end of the semester, but have real tangible connections to the outside world and seem relevant in the lives of ourselves and our students. And 
uh, and it is even a model of what could be considered a very small scale social science experiment. And, and it's an opportunity to talk with students about all the um, caveats and, and advantages to science, what's quantifiable and reliable and testable, um, what's ambiguous and subjective and uh, qualitative uh, without getting too technical and expecting undergraduates to be graduate students. And then maybe there's even some bit in there about information literacy. And I'm constantly talking about that and thinking about that in my classes. Um, and the backdrop against which all this sits is when I read experts in psychology and, and other brain sciences, um, the lesson that I try to take away is that of intellectual humility. And so we're not constantly thinking that we are correct and, and everyone we, we encounter is wrong or an idiot. Um, and so the, the brain I think is mysterious, it is contradictory, it is opaque, it is hard to fathom. Um, that is the brain is, has a hard time understanding itself. And so some caution is in order as we attempt to gain new knowledge about the world. And this has so many relevant connections to general education, to information literacy, critical thinking, and our habits of mind. And so we can find this sentiment expressed in a variety of unexpected places, like uh, as far back in time as uh, the New Testament. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own? And uh, this is, I believe the words of Jesus, uh, from the English Standard Version, because using the King James would just be pretentious. And we can find the idea expressed in the works of Homer. You can use facts to prove anything that's even remotely true. Facts, schmacks. And actually, as you can tell, this is from the Simpsons, not from the, uh, the Greek epic poet. Uh, and this is from the season nine episode called Lisa the Skeptic, which is an interesting exploration of the contradiction between science and superstition. I highly recommend it. But more to the point, more seriously, is from uh, another psychology scholar whom I respect, um, Emily Pronin from Princeton University. What do I believe are the roots of my political beliefs? People will, will swear that the roots of their beliefs are just a rational analysis. I take the positions I do because those are the correct positions if you analyze the issues. The other side is influenced by ideology, by self-interest, by prejudice. I think we can recognize a little bit of that in our own thinking. And so what's to be done about that? Well, we'll, we'll get onto that. And so uh, the central feature of the righteous mind and what's the kernel of this activity is talking about the moral foundations theory. And this is uh, posited by Jonathan Haidt and uh, his fellow moral psychology researchers. And there's research and evidence suggesting that uh, our judgments are visceral. That is the way we make decisions about right and wrong, decide what actions to take or how we interpret the goodness or badness of events in the world is determined by the gut. Intuition comes first, reason second. And that is, we, we think we have a conclusion. Uh, it's, it's not entirely known to us how we arrived at that conclusion, but then we send our rational faculties out on a fact-finding mission. We come back with a piece of evidence and we say, see, see, I'm right, you're wrong, and you uh, will have to come around to my point of view. And naturally the other person believes the same thing. And so whether it's in Thanksgiving, arguing with your aunts and uncles or it is in an online forum where people have extreme political views. Uh, everyone argues vociferously and no one ever changes their mind and just de degenerates from there. Um, so why is it that th this happens or where do we get our values from? They arise from innate moral mo modules. And to unpack that, that means that the way we understand what's good and bad about the world is, is innate. And that is, it is, uh, written in advance of experience, but it is rewritten by experience. So every human being who's ordinarily formed has a sense of what is right and what is wrong. And even more, um, the same categories of things are perceived as right and wrong among us. But what's different is the, uh, the way we weight 
the rightness or wrongness of certain things. And those are the, the moral modules they talk about. Uh, and these things are evolved in us. They come from our, our ancient psychology. And now I'm gonna tie off one of those threads from the, uh, the tongues at the beginning of the presentation. Modules are like taste buds. Uh, when we find ourselves approving or disapproving, uh, when we make decisions about what's the, the right course of action, we are doing so based on our tastes, our intuitions about what is the good thing and what is a bad thing. And so just like in the way that uh, we all, for the most part, are capable of detecting sour and salt and sweet and bitter, we don't prefer the same kinds of foods. And likewise, we don't all prefer the same kinds of actions, the same kinds of policies, or the same kinds of societies. And so our values uh, are different for explicable reasons. And that goes a great deal of length towards understanding integrated perspective. So I wanna describe in broad strokes what the, those modules are. Now this moral foundations theory could accommodate other modules or changing the modules that it, uh, it posits exist. But I'll just go over the first set of simple uh, moral modules that this theory holds. So these modules are pairs of opposites. And so care on the one hand and harm on the other. Obviously, because we are primates, we care for our young and we care for those around us, our kin and even strangers. We have a preference for that. We have an aversion to harm. That care harm is uh, the first moral module theorized by moral foundations theory. And then fairness and cheating. We obviously, uh, as pro-social creatures, we don't like um, free riders. If you don't go out on the hunt, you don't get to eat all the food. And so we prefer fairness and we dislike cheating. And we have uh, some preference or deference to authority and we dislike subversion in some respects. And there's loyalty also called in-group. And this is also a pro-social evolved feature and the opposite of that being betrayal, which most of us do not prefer. And the last one in moral foundations theory is purity and degradation. So uh, purity is evolution's answer to germ theory before germ theory existed. Of course, none of us like uh, bad smells or decaying things or uh, fetid things. And so we have an aversion to, to degraded or low quality um, things that might cause us to get sick. And because we have symbolic thinking, we have societies in the past have applied purity to um, metaphorical things like people or groups. And you all know where it leads when people start to talk about other groups of people as impure or parasitic or um, vermin, that doesn't go any place good. And so these modules, care harm, fairness cheating, authority subversion, loyalty betrayal, purity degradation are, according to this theory, the moral foundations of our beliefs and our beliefs about politics. But, and this is, this is the big but, and this is why this activity works, liberals and conservatives differ in the modules that we tend to value. And so, and this, according to Hyatt and his fellow researchers, cuts across cultures and, and uh, political parties, liberals tend to lean more on the care and fairness modules where conservatives have a more uh, widespread uh, covering all five of the modules, but, but tend to increase in the authority, reliance on loyalty, preference for purity. And so uh, liberals tend to lean towards the first two, care and fairness, and where uh, conservatives more towards the, the latter three. So we can understand each other a great deal better if we get a handle on that, if, if this theory uh, carries weight, if this is reliable. And so now for, we have taken the political compass quiz questionnaire, and I've gotten your submissions on that. Now what I will ask you to do is, and this, this is gonna take a little bit of time too, so I apologize for more awkward silence, is to go to this link, which I will put in the chat, if I can find the chat. And, oh gosh, what did I do with it? Please help me find the chat. It's there, keep looking. 
the uh, so we've got meeting controls. Uh, all right, I'm going to stop sharing and open up the chat. And then, okay, so here's the link to the registration for the Moral Foundations site. And I'm going to put a little text chat in here to break up the two different. Now, links. what's going to happen when I put my email? Like, I should really do this. I trust yeah, you, so this librarian. Is completely optional. Um, but if you if you submitted your your data for the first political compass quiz, I, I hope that you will do it for the second for this moral foundations uh, questionnaire. And I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. Um, now they they say that they will never use or give out your email address. Um, it's obviously your choice whether you participate in that. You do not have to. Uh, and there's a sort of annoyingly lengthy registration. So I apologize for that, but I'll let you, it'll take a, a minute or two or three for you to get through. So I appreciate your perseverance if, when you sign up for that. Um, and not what I wanted. Once you sign in, once you have finished registering and you sign into that yourmorals.org, there's a long list of questionnaires that you can take and you will look for the one that says moral foundations and you will have a link that says take survey and because I've already taken it that's not there but please do click take survey and that will take some time as well so please register for yourmorals.org if you choose and then take the moral foundations questionnaire and likewise as we did before putting your uh, moral foundations values into this spreadsheet is what we'll do after that. Those results will look like this. So I'm going to shut up and let you register and take that moral foundations questionnaire and I'll answer any questions if you are unsure how to proceed or have trouble getting your results into the spreadsheet. <laughs> whether or not someone was good at math. And it's important that the it, when you are done the moral foundations questionnaire, when you put your values in, that they go on the same row as your political compass responses. At least I think that's important.
maybe we could also use this for dating mike <laughs> so if, um, if people are single and they want to hook up with other people who share your values you let me know maybe we could make that happen as a follow up to the workshop actually phil phil just yelled over my shoulder that is not appropriate <laughs> <laughs> inappropriate workplace topic uh no but it's a good idea and um subject of follow-up research I know these are lengthy questionnaires. If people watching the recording land in one of these vast silences, they're gonna wonder what the heck's going on. If they like skip around the video. Normally we could edit those out, but with all these presentations, you'd yeah. be lucky just to get the recording. <laughs> Ah, so I will put the link to the same spreadsheet. Okay, got it. Thank you. Sorry, I found it. Thanks, Robin. And if you put the results in the same row as you you did uh, the political compass results, that would be helpful.
Okay, I see almost complete uh, for every person who put in something for the political compass questionnaire, the moral foundations questionnaire is, is in uh, with just a, a couple of exceptions. Just give a minute or two, maybe three more. Okay, I can see some more numbers coming in. And Mike, you saw the time check there, yeah? Yeah, okay. uh, it's 1217 right now? Yep. Okay. Yep, I am anxiously watching the, uh, the clock. Okay, so the In row 20, there's uh, moral foundations numbers, but not uh, political compass. Should those go in one of the other rows? Row 14 too, I think, right? Yeah. I came in too late to do the first survey. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry. That's me in 20. <gasps> okay. <gasps> I'm not Barb, you just outed yourself. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, Barbara, I I send you the, I'll send you the link. Yeah, I missed that link part. Sorry. Yeah, I, I just sent it directly to you. Cool. You mean like on the chat? Yep. Okay. There it is. Got it. Um, okay. So I think. Okay, uh, so except for Barb, I think everyone has put in uh, numbers. So what I'm gonna do is delete the empty rows. Oh, here, I'll, I'll just go to the share. So now on my shared screen, you will see those numbers. I'm gonna delete blank row number seven, blank number 13 and 14. Okay. So I will now do Excel wizardry, which is completely a road operation. I am not a statistician by any stretch of the imagination, um, but this is uh, part of the activity to, to show results 
as like a mini scientific study that's, that's reproducible and testable and uh, we can see whether it confirms or disconfirms the hypothesis of how liberals and conservatives tend to differ in their uh, moral reckoning. And so you may be interested in, in doing this and uh, the nuts and bolts of this Excel operation are useful. So what I'm gonna do is highlight the average from the political compass uh, row, rather column, and uh, each of the moral foundations columns one by one. So uh, two columns selected, uh, the values and the headings each, and I'm gonna to go to, over to insert, and hopefully you all can see that. And I'm gonna put in a scatter plot. And so you can see the results, the responses for the political compass uh, survey and the moral foundations questionnaire mapped against each other. And uh, I'm gonna do this for each of the five foundations so I'm gonna take now the average of the political compass results, and I'm gonna control click and highlight the uh, fairness column under moral foundations theory. And I'm gonna put in a, another graph. I wanna let me insert a graph here. Um, I had some trouble with the online version of Excel before, and I'm gonna open this in the desktop app, which I will share with you. I can share the screen just as well. And in fact, it works better. So I'm gonna open Excel and stop sharing my browser and I will share Excel. And this is the, the unpleasant but necessary, um, but not that long uh, nuts and bolts process of actually crunching these results, but it doesn't take much time. So here we have can you see my Excel window there? I've highlighted yep. these. I'm going to insert scatter plot. And here's uh, this is the icing on the cake. So right here, what we have, you can tweak the, the labels and how the graph is presented. Um, so adding a trend line, and that's by hitting that green plus and checking off the trend line button. And I'm going to do that for each of these. So I'm going to highlight the political average, and then the fairness column. And I will repeat the scatter. What's our time at? Okay, we've got fairness, and I'm gonna add a trend line there. And I'm gonna move that, whoops, move that graph out of the way and do the same thing with loyalty. Now, this is something, if you were, did this activity in your class, uh, that you could do in between classes, like if you did the questionnaires during class or even outside of class, then you could crunch it and do these operations afterwards. Um, or you could do it during class and just try to fill the, uh, the silence by rambling on as I am doing right now. My wit is endlessly entertaining. And so here we have authority, adding a trend line. That's interesting. Okay, and now the last one, purity, insert, scatter, add a trend line, excellent. So here, I'm gonna take these and put them in my presentation and I will show this, the results that we got just now with this uh, real-ish like presentation, uh, scientific study, you might say side by side with the results that the original researchers found. And so, I'm gonna put each of those into their respective places on the slides once those load and they have, that's there. And authority. And fairness.
Oops, did I delete one? I may have done that. Ah, there it is. Okay. And now I'm ready. I'm going to share the presentation once again. Okay. Thank you for your patience and your data, your responses. So what you can see here on the left is the results for this group. Uh, to the left is more conservative, uh, rather to the left is more liberal, to the right is more conservative. Higher up on the graph means the, the more concerned you are about care and harm and lower down means the less you value care versus harm as opposed to the other moral modules. And on the right is the graph that uh, Jonathan Haidt and his other researchers found in uh, studies across countries and across cultures of how people, liberal and conservative, tend to value the moral foundation modules. And so you can see the trend line for our group, harm goes down as you become more conservative ever so slightly. And the same, if you look at the blue trend line on the right side, uh, the harm uh, module goes down as people become more conservative. And so let's look at the others, fairness. So the data for fairness are likewise in our group, uh, as people become more conservative, they ever so slightly have concern for, for the fairness module a little bit less. And that's consistent with what uh, Haidt and his fellow researchers found. And then if we go over to, well, chart title, but I'm not sure why that is that instead of authority, maybe I didn't highlight it right. Um, the uh, authority trend line seems to map. Now these numbers can't be, you can't do mathematical operations on these because they're not quantitatively equivalent, but you can see that the trend is that as individuals become more conservative in our group and in the original research group, uh, concern for authority tends to go up and that might explain things like deference to police or to authority figures like presidents and um, principals and other kinds of uh, church leaders and, and things. And that seems like more conservative trait. Oh, and uh, oh, that was authority. So I think this is, this is in group loyalty, my apologies. So there's authority as a likewise similar slope and looking at purity, uh, very much the same as people become more conservative, their reliance on the purity foundation increases both in our group and in the uh, wider research group. And so the next time you are in conflict with someone at uh, dinner or on in an online forum or someone you meet on the street or at a protest or say uh, in Washington DC, you can understand you probably won't come to an exact agreement with that person, but you may gain a, an appreciation for others' perspectives by understanding that their foundations, their moral foundations may simply have a different emphasis than your own. And you can work from that as a starting point. Uh, how scientific is moral foundations theory? Well, in this completely bogus spectrum of scientific validity, where you have astro astrology on the left, which is an absolute uh, unscientific idea, to relativity on the right, where is moral foundations theory? Probably somewhere in the middle, subject to fur further investigation. Um, who knows where that will land. You can see a lot of connections to the habits of mind, particularly the integrated perspective uh, and all of those signposts within that, but I can also see purposeful communication, the effective application strategies for communication uh, under problem solving, you have problem framing. I think this exercise gives excellent uh, validity and connection there. And under self-regulated learning, I would say metacognitive awareness, understanding how it is our thoughts arrived where they are is incredibly valid. So that is the activity. If you wanted to incorporate any or all parts of this, I would be happy to help you, to show you, uh, enjoy the recording. And uh, this is, um, that has been my presentation. I'm very glad and thankful for you all coming. And I'm just now getting over to uh, a chat and, oh, it's from Liz All. That may be a little bit of snark, but not undeserved. So there's no time left, but I'd be happy